Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this Francis Taylor Building Public Law webinar. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Richard Honey. Um, I'm a barrister at Francis Taylor Building and chair of the Public Law Practice Group at um, Francis Taylor Building, and I'm going to be chairing this seminar. I hope you can all see and hear me, or, or those, uh, those phoning in, of course, um, can only hear me, at least. We can't see or hear you, and indeed the other participants can't see or hear you either. So this is not much like a face-to-face -face seminar, but we are, um, I hope, getting used to the concept of webinars. I've spoken at half a dozen or so of these over the last six weeks or so. Um, and it does seem to me that this format has some advantages, at least over the traditional face-to-face -face seminars. We can accommodate far more people, uh, and indeed people who are not able to travel in any event, and people who work flexibly. I'm very pleased to see that so many people have booked and then logged in this morning for the webinar. Uh, please bear with us through any technical hitches. We are going to try to keep it simple in terms of the technology. So some ground rules before we start. Um, we'll take questions via the Q&A function on the system. You should be able to access that by clicking on the icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the icon, the Q&A icon appears when the cursor is over the bottom of the screen. Please do feel free to type in questions or indeed comments as we go. We will answer the questions in a block at the end after the talks, or at least as many as we've got time for, because we're going to stop at 11.30 today, even if we've not got through all the questions. So um, do feel free to email me or any of the speakers afterwards if there are any burning questions which remain outstanding. Um, hopefully the chat function um, ought to have been disabled um, if it hasn't been, um, we're going to ignore it anyway. And similarly, the raising the hand function won't get you anywhere. Please use the Q&A if you want to communicate with us. Um, we will be able to share our screens during the presentation uh, to show PowerPoint slides, um, but we'll also be emailing out the PowerPoint slides afterwards so that you've got copies of those. We are going to be recording the webinar today um, just to let you know and it may be published afterwards. So this morning we've got four presentations covering uh, general public law topics which are going to be relevant to a wide range of public authorities both local and central government authorities, and indeed um, organisations that have to deal with those authorities. Three of the topics raise issues which apply to all public authorities, uh, reconciling common law principles with statutory provisions, giving reasons for decisions, and withdrawing reports or decisions once they're issued. The other subject is a very topical one, that is the effect of COVID-19 on adult and social care provision. That provides um, an important insight into how public authorities are governed by statute and guidance and how that has to be flexed in this emergency period. It is a very interesting public law case study. I'm going to introduce our speakers, five speakers for the four topics, as they come to speak. Our uh, first speaker is Melissa Murphy, who is going to deal with the relationship between common law principles and statutory provisions. Now, Melissa advises on and appears in cases concerning public and administrative law matters uh, very frequently, principally those with a planning or a compulsory purchase focus. Uh, and she has at the moment two public law cases which are en route to the Court of Appeal at the moment, hopefully for hearing later this year. That's the Hillingdon Council Challenge in relation to HS2 uh, and the Browns Hill Planning Challenge. So I'm now going to hand over to Melissa uh, and invite her to make her presentation. 
Thank you, Richard. You join me for the inaugural Francis Taylor Building bookcase competition where we put to the test the proposition that the books that surround you may well be more important than what you actually say. As a matter of fact, my undergraduate degree was in English literature, but set on a career at the bar, I undertook what was effectively a crash course in law, the postgraduate diploma in law, followed by the bar vocational course, then pupillage. And over 19 years of practice, what this practitioner experience has taught me is that in order to use the law effectively in the rather instrumental rather than academic way demanded in litigation, we must be students of both the common law and statute. And so what this talk does is looks at some of the intersections between statute and common law. Uh, just um, a word about format. In a moment I'm going to um, attempt to share some slides with you. I'm going to turn off the video so that what you'll have is slides and a voiceover and then I hope to come back on video at the very end. And I say it all in that rather um, timid way, having had one or two um, IT problems uh, to date. So we'll see how we get on. And that should have my slides up. And what you should have now um, is a title slide. Uh, see, and you can see that what's promised for the next 10 minutes or so is an exploration of that relationship between common law principles and statute. In more detail here, a contents page. And the theme I intend to develop is that we operate within an evolving legal system in this country. Continuity is provided by the common law. It has an important role in restraining abuses of power and upholding what we think of as the rule of law. In the public law context, though decision makers are in the main creatures born and regulated by statute, common law principles nonetheless vie with black letter law for primacy. This can be seen in various canons of statutory um, construction, the application of which can see the black letters of the law smudged, edited, and even erased. I ask the question then, are there common law principles operating in this context which are freestanding, or must all be coloured by their context? If the language that I'm using of impact, of vying, smudging, and so on, suggests a struggle, then whether or not that's accurate, it's not a novel way of thinking um, about the common law and statute, or indeed the institutions of the state. Here, checks and balances, a suggestion of some imbalance between them. And this is an old cartoon from The Spectator, uh, dating from one of the occasions on which Michael Gove suggested that the balance had tipped too far against parliamentary power. I find myself rather doubting Mr Gove's conclusion here, and although uh, perhaps there's a further theme we could explore on this subject, I, I think I'm going to have to acknowledge this isn't the occasion on which to do it. But it harks to a debate about legitimacy. Which has the better claim to justice? Is it the statute law made sometimes reacting to public sentiment or outrage? but by democratically elected members of parliament? Is it the judicial decision made by an appointee attempting to achieve a just outcome and following the wisdom of earlier cases or perhaps just avoiding um, hardship? Which is the more representative? Which of these can say that they better reflect the social mores of the day? Uh, I won't of course resolve the debate, but instead I offer the image um, which I have in mind when thinking about statute and common law as two ancient trees standing side by side, intertwined and interdependent, vying for the light. The examples we will look at provide the legal <clears throat> roots for that image. <clears throat> 
before turning to the detail of this slide, a, a word about jurisdiction, as you will or you may know, the first of Lord Diplock's principles of lawful administration set out in GCHQ is legality, where the jurisdiction of a public authority has been exceeded. It will have acted unlawfully and its action or decision will be liable to be quashed by the court. So where the question arises whether a public authority is acting lawfully or not, the nature and extent of its uh, power or, or duty has to be identified in most cases by seeking the intention of Parliament as expressed or implied in the relevant Act. And the correct interpretation of statutory uh, powers is ultimately a matter for the courts governed by principles and canons of interpretation and that brings us to these specific examples you see on the slide. In examples of statutory interpretation. The first purposive interpretation hot off the press. It is a little over a week since judgment was given in an important Supreme Court case applying the Padfield principle. And we're going to explore that in a little detail. The second example, two points on this. First, case law suggests that there is such thing as fundamental common law principles. And secondly, that they will not be interfered with, save by the clearest statutory language. The third example can be thought of in this way, that Parliament cannot have intended such and such. In the next series of slides, I'm going to consider examples one and two a little further, but as to the third, well, it may be thought to be in the eye of the beholder whether consequences are, for example, objectionable or undesirable. You should have a slide now on purpose of interpretation, background and statutory purpose. What is interesting to me about this principle of statutory construction is its grounding in the separation of powers. It is in effect the court controlling the actions of the executive by holding it to the intentions of Parliament when legislation was enacted. Statutory purpose is to be divined from the language um, of the Act in its context. You will see that in a later slide I emphasise that um, it is the courts who are the arbiters of what constitutes statutory purpose. I mentioned Padfield on the slide, it described as a groundbreaking decision, certainly was in its time. It, it was about jurisdiction, the ministerial decision not to refer a complaint to a committee established to hear such complaints. That was not a lawful exercise of discretion because it thwarted the very purpose of the relevant act. The courts were not prepared to accept that and in quashing the decision adopted an approach focused on statutory purpose. You can see noted on the slide um, the interrogation of statutory purpose, one for the courts looking at the language within its context. As I've mentioned, the judgment in the Palestine Solidarity Campaign case was given a, a little over a week ago. The slide here in the second bullet point notes the outcome, which is that the government's guidance to local authorities on ethical pensions investments was ultra vires. The government was not entitled under the relevant legislation to forbid local authorities from pursuing policies contrary uh, investment policy contrary to uh, UK foreign policy or defence policy. And the case includes points of real interest for the public lawyer. As you can see, it confirms that there is no equivalent to the Chevron doctrine in the United States. And the Chevron doctrine is where a statute directed to a government agency is ambiguous, the court will follow any permissible reading adopted by the agency. Well, that is not the approach taken in England and Wales. Ascertaining statutory purposes is the responsibility of the court and is not a matter left at large for decision makers. It seems to me that this case reflects a judicial robustness similar to that in Padfield, a preparedness, indeed a determination to confine the executive to the proper scope of powers granted by Parliament.
it's worth noting in addition the divergence in judicial thinking between the high court and court of appeal to the split in the supreme court itself as to statutory purpose that's suggested that suggests that the principle of construction is perhaps simpler to explain than it is to apply. It's also noteworthy that the government has signalled an intention to legislate to achieve the same object as the guidance. If that happens, it would be um, proper as it would involve parliamentary scrutiny, unlike the publication of guidance. And later on, we'll come to the um, principle of legality in that context. And to our now to our second example. This slide um, repays careful consideration. I set out um, part of the judgment of Lord Brown Wilkinson there. In Pearson, the House of Lords recognised that it is a principle of statutory construction that general words in a statute will be limited impliedly so as to preserve the ordinary rules and principles of the common law. This gives us a useful insight into the relationship between statute and common law. That the common law will yield to the superiority of Parliament only when the power of the latter is used clearly, deliberately, precisely, bringing to bear the full scrutiny necessary when such a choice is taken. And that is the principle of legality in this context, set out here on the slide, taken from Sims. That Parliament squarely confronts what it's doing and accepts the political costs. Well all that said, well, what are these fundamental principles? <laughs> you won't find them listed exhaustively, indeed I would argue that there is no closed list. They seem to be recognised in case law when there is a need to rely on them to achieve justice, to prevent hardship or to restrain an abuse of power. And so what I do on this next slide is give you some examples to consider. You'll see I've included concepts of natural justice, which would include fair, fair amongst other things, fair procedures. A recent employment case, recognising a common law entitlement to access justice and that was in the context of an, the appointment of a litigation friend. What about the availability of judicial review? Is this too part of a fundamental common law principle, this hostility to uh, ouster clauses that we've seen for example in the uh, Privacy International case last year? And principles of consider, uh, consistency in administrative decision making. What's consistent in each of these just examples are that they are not uh, derived from statute. They may well be coloured by their statutory context, but they are judge made principles governing administrative decision making in the statutory context, pulling, I would say, the pendulum away from a strict statutory approach. That's, I'm going to close my slides now and I'm hoping to be able to uh, open, reopen my video. There we are. Um, I included some um, rather fanciful uh, imagery, you might think, in all of that. I hope that it serves to emphasise the vitality of common law principles, that they are alive and thriving and capable of being um, relied upon. So with all that, um, Richard, I'm going to hand back over to you across the river from me in Kent, and I hope thriving in your own right. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed, Melissa. Um, that was very good. Now, uh, just a reminder to people, please, if you've got comments or questions, please ask them through the Q&A function on the system that you'll find at the bottom of the screen. Now, our next speaker uh, is Annabelle Graham-Paul. Uh, Annabelle has acted in a number of leading judicial reviews over the years, including, for example, the case of Powys and Price in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, which covered local government reorganisation.
um, but also deals with judicial reviews in the fields of planning, environment, licensing, education, and equalities. Now, Annabelle joins us from Carmarthenshire in Southwest Wales. Um, she's got particular experience of uh, Welsh devolved public law issues and is a member of the Attorney General's Regional Panel of Council for Wales. Uh, in relation to the particular topic that she's speaking on today, she's been acting for a number of NHS trusts in relation to NHS funding and developer contributions. So I'll hand over now please to Annabelle. Thank you very much, Richard, um, and I hope everybody can see and hear me. Good. Um, as, uh, as, as Richard said at the outset, um, we're moving from the general principles that Melissa has talked about to the specific uh, now and the very topical subject of adult and social care and coronavirus. And when we started thinking about the programme for this seminar, it was uh, quite a few weeks ago, um, and I was sort of thinking, well, this, I'm sure this is something that's going to be interesting, um, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was going to say. Um, the Coronavirus Act 2020 have made a number of changes, uh, legislative changes to several duties placed on local authorities in respect of adult and social care. And so that was something to go on. But as time has, has moved on um, and the crisis has developed, the particular focus has uh, really shifted now uh, a lot from, from, from the tragedy of deaths in, in hospitals and the community to the really acute situation of um, the rising numbers of deaths in care homes. Um, and so there have been um, a, a number of recent decisions where uh, people have um, quite, uh, quite understandably sought to remove um, re remove residents from care homes um, in order perhaps to take them away from that uh, risk or for, for other reasons. And so those are, those are uh, decisions that I'd like to talk about in particular today because they raise a number of important issues about human rights and how you weigh in the balance uh, all of the different factors that you have to take in, in, into account, particularly in, in an emergency situation. So I am now going to uh, share my slides. So if you would just bear with me for a second, as it's sometimes a little bit of a fiddle. Um, sorry, I can't see them coming up at the moment. That's not really very helpful, is it? Um, No, nothing is happening at the moment. That's not very helpful. Right. Um, stop that. Try again. Try again. Try again. They are open on my... Let's try this. Here we are. I'm there. Just thanks for your patience. I hope they're there now. And someone, Richard, can you put a thumbs up if you can see them? Yeah, we can see yeah, them. Perfect. Thank you. I've got there. Right. Phew. Got the stressful bit over of the technology. Okay. So, um, turning then to, um, as I said, the overview of what I'm going to talk about. And there's a picture of this very, uh, I got this from the, from the newspapers. This, uh, th this is a care home in the Isle of Skye, which you may have read about on the news, where of this awful situation. Obviously, Isle of Skye, very remote population, but but the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 has really been sort of focused on this particular care home where um, 30 of the 34 residents um, ha have got COVID-19 as well as 24 uh, members of staff. And I think the deaths are, are rising and there were sort of five or so this morning. And, they, you know, so it is a, 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 an acute uh, a situation with regard to the, the ability of a pandemic to go around these sorts, these sorts of institutions. Um, so starting first, though, if I go back to what, what we were originally going to talk about with the um, uh, legislative changes and um, the Coronavirus Act, um, Section 16 and Schedule 12, 
uh, as I mentioned, provides for the suspension and modification of several duties under the Care Act 2014. And this was done by government essentially to um, give local authorities some slack in relation to some of their uh, duties so that they can prioritise care and support to the most urgent and serious cases. So essentially, it's all of the duties to carry out assessments uh, of the needs of adults and of carers, duties to carry out financial assessments, duties to provide reasons for assessments, uh, duties to prepare care and support plans, uh, duties where an adult moves from one local authority area to another, all of those types of things um, are um, either modified or suspended for a period of six months subject to parliamentary review. Uh, and there are similar modifications that have been made to the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 as well. Um, now, the guidance that accompanies that makes clear that, that um, the the suspension of the duties is only supposed to take effect if demand pressures and workforce illness during the pandemic means that an, an authority is at an imminent risk of failing to fulfil its duties and uh, it should only last for the duration of the emergency. So it's not necessarily the case that every local authority will suspend these duties, it just gives them the discretion to do so if they are under such demand or they have staff illness that they do not have the resources to carry out everything. So the consequence of this is that prioritisation decisions may need to be made and an authority may have a situation where they carry, can carry out some of these functions but can't carry them out to their full extent and so they're going to have to on a case by case basis decide where their priorities lie. Um, and so there is guidance for them to have regard to uh, in exercising this discretion, uh, which I've set out there. There's an ethical framework and that sets out eight themes of respect, reasonableness, minimising harm, inclusiveness, accountability, flexibility, proportionality and community. Um, and the guidance suggests that this might be a useful framework for as a sort of checklist for an authority to use when making decisions on this. Um, and the guidance acknowledges that there may be tensions between the principles that will require judgments to be made on the extent that a particular value or principle can be applied in the context of each particular decision. So there's um, material considerations that need to be taken into account in the guidance. There's a discretion um, and then there's going to have to be ultimately judgments that are going to be made. There's also going to be issues about consistency uh, and reasons and how individual cases are dealt with. So all of our classic uh, public law principles are really going to come into play where you've got uh, duties that you normally just have to carry out and now you're being told well actually you don't have to carry them out but you ought to if you can and you may have to prioritize some people over others so i think that this is an area where there's clearly going to be scope for challenge on an individual case um, if um, if an aggrieved person feels that the guidance hasn't been taken into account properly if they can't understand why for example an authority has not carried out an assessment in relation to them or, or their relative but they have carried out an assessment in relation to others what are the reasons for the differences how do you compare one person to another um, so we'll have to wait and see uh, how that transpires now of course authorities may be able to function perfectly normally um, but uh, that will just depend on what resources they have so now I'm going to turn to uh, look at the issue of removing the vulnerable from care homes and I've put here the uh, COVID-19 uh, graph of deaths um, which is, uh, is I think tells the story pretty clearly that whilst hospital deaths rose up very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic the care home deaths have risen at a slightly uh, later and slower rate but uh, as we reach the end of April beginning of May time the proportion of deaths in care homes has become much greater 
um, than, than, than those in other places. And so uh, understandably, it's become uh, something of an issue as to um, the appropriateness of people staying in those settings. So for anyone who's, um, who, who, who's um, new to this area or, um, or hasn't looked at it for a while, um, you can't just simply remove someone who has been, um, where there has been a court order for them to be, um, to, to be looked after in a, in a residential setting. The Mental Capacity Act 2005 uh, includes a number of deprivation of liberty safeguards. And these are a set of checks to ensure that any care that restricts a person's liberty is both appropriate and in their best interests. So you need to make an order, or you need to make an application to the court um, in order to remove a resident from those kind of settings uh, where they have been ordered to be placed there and the court will consider what's in their best interests. So two very recent decisions of the Court of Protection have looked at the issue um, the first one is a decision of Mr. Justice Hayden, which was uh, made at the beginning of the sort of pandemic on the 3rd of April. And the latter one is one of Mrs. Justice Levin, um, which was handed down uh, recently on the 20th of April. So starting with uh, Mr. Justice Hayden's uh, decision in BP and Surrey, this was an application by the daughter of an 83 year old who wanted him to go home and live with her. His care home had stopped all family visits in accordance with the government's guidance on, on coronavirus and he was limited to um, electronic means of communication with her. Um, the, the, notably the Court of Protection said that her plans for, for her father to return to home with her were actually in truth not a realistic option and so the court focused on, on the contact with her family. And so it was argued that Article 5 uh, and Article 8 were being infringed um, and Mr Justice Hayden agreed that they were by depriving uh, BP of the visits from his family. Uh, however, he noted that Article 15 permits derogation from, from both, both Articles 5 and 8 in situations of public emergency um, threatening the life of the nation. Uh, and so notably in relation to our current situation of the coronavirus pandemic, he said this was undoubtedly a public emergency within Article 15. Uh, and so the derogation from Articles 5 and 8 would undoubtedly be met. Uh, and in light of that, he said that the proposals by the care home for indirect contact by, by FaceTime or Skype or whatever were proportionate given the extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic. So that decision has essentially put uh, an end to any challenges about um, home visits or, oh, sorry, about visits to care homes. And it may also be relevant in other contexts uh, when looking at other restrictions that have been placed on us as a result of the pandemic, for example, movement restrictions and um, how the derogation might play um, with that. So then by contrast, though, we, we have then the decision from Mrs. Justice Levin in AO and the Royal Borough of Greenwich, which had somewhat different uh, facts and a different outcome. So AO was living in a care home, but she had terminal ovarian cancer. And she has uh, actually now subsequent to two days after the judgment was handed down, she, she actually died. Uh, no family visits were allowed and video calls were not an effective way of maintaining contact with her given her condition. Her daughter made an application to uh, challenge the depriva deprivation of liberty and she wanted to have her to come home uh, to live with her. Um, the real issue, uh, Mrs Justice Levin said, was whether it was in AO's best interests to be moved to her daughter's home to die. Um, so in light of that, uh, Mrs Justice Neven distinguished BP on the basis that BP was not terminally ill. Uh, and she said that the ability to die with one's family is one of the most fundamental parts of any right to private and family life. And thus the interfer interference would require a particularly high degree of justification. So whilst the derogation uh, in Article 15 would apply, you have to look at the individual facts and where someone is terminally ill, uh, it required a higher uh, degree of justification more than simply depriving somebody of the ability to have visits from their 
family. And so in the circumstances of that case, she held that it was in AO's best interest to live with her family. And she also found that appropriate palliative care could be provided for her by district nurses and, and that kind of thing at home. Um, and so she would have, um, so she wouldn't, so, so it was in her best interest to be cared for at home. Um, so that's a fact specific for that particular individual. However, Mrs. Justice Leaven also made some more general points about coronavirus. She said that it was notable in her case that it wasn't being argued that there was any public health reason to prevent AO leaving the care home to live with her, fa to live with her family. So no one was suggesting that AO had, for example, had coronavirus and might infect others by moving back with her family. Furthermore, although the risk of AO contracting COVID-19 in the care home was argued in support of it being in her best interest to go home, Mrs. Justice Lieben said, well, there wasn't any evidence that anyone in that particular care home had COVID-19. It wasn't possible for her to quantify that risk. And so she said it wasn't a matter she had to consider. She was simply looking at where was the most appropriate place for AO to end her life. Um, and she finally considered the question of who was going to collect AO and bring her home. And she held that a family member collecting AO from the care home would have a reasonable excuse for leaving home in accordance with the regulations. And so that would be uh, acceptable travel. So those were the points that she made that might uh, have a wider effect on other cases. The scenario that I've been considering, which hasn't yet been, which hasn't yet come to the Court of Protection, but I can imagine will be of interest to people, is the situation where a patient or a resident is not terminally ill. Uh, adequate care can or could be provided for them at home, and the risk of them contracting COVID-19 in the care home is the basis for the proposed move. So the scenario that if one were, uh, did have a family member in that care home in the Isle of Skye, um, they are at high risk of contracting COVID-19. Uh, you could provide care for them at home. Would that be a basis for uh, finding it in their best interests to move home? And how would you balance the risk of them perhaps already having it and um, then bringing it back to the family household. So um, there are a number of very difficult uh, judgments that will have to be made. Um, and as the pandemic continues, I think this is going to be an issue that the Court of Protection uh, will have to consider. Um, and perhaps we'll have to do another webinar at a later date to, to update you on, on what's happened with that. But as I said at the outset, it's a very topical subject, but it also raises so many different public law issues around discretion, judgments, material con considerations, balances, human rights, that um, um, at the current time really is um, raising a lot of issues in terms of, of public law. So that's a quick overview of um, that particular topic on adult and social care. But um, yes, we'll be taking questions later, but do email me or send me a, a, a LinkedIn message or anything like that if, if you have any experiences of this or um, any thoughts to add. Thank you. So I will pass you back to Richard now. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Annabelle for um, a fascinating insight into a tragic situation which has challenges for public law as well. Um, just a reminder for those people uh, listening or watching, if you've got questions or comments, please use the question and answer function on the system to ask them. Um, and a reminder also that we are recording this webinar. So we're moving uh, back now to a more general public law topic, that is the duty to give reasons. Uh, and we're moving from uh, Annabelle in Wales to Conor Fegan, who's speaking to us from Northern Ireland where he's spending the emergency period. Um, Connor joined Chambers in October 2019 
uh, and is already building up wide experience of public law matters, including in particular local authority decision making, uh, and has already appeared alone for a defendant in the High Court in a substantive judicial review hearing. So I will hand over now to Connor. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, hopefully the slides uh, will, will have come up on the screen. Um, as Richard has said, I'm speaking today about the duty to give reasons for public authority uh, decisions, uh, the general public law obligation to do so. Uh, and in particular, there are three questions that I want to uh, explore during this presentation. The first is, when is a public authority under a duty to give reasons? Uh, the second is what a public authority is required to do to comply with that duty. Uh, and thirdly, what happens then if a public authority uh, fails to comply with that duty? Uh, how will the court uh, view that particular uh, breach? Turning to the first of those questions, uh, and I think the one that perhaps causes uh, the most uh, litigation, uh, the existence of a duty to give reasons, there are broadly speaking uh, three potential sources of a duty to give reasons. The first is a statutory duty, which can arise um, either expressly or by implication. The second uh, relates to the common law, um, where the common law will step in and require reasons to be given on grounds of procedural fairness. And the third, again arising under the common law, relates to the existence of a legitimate expectation to give reasons, either as a result of an express promise or through uh, conduct. Uh, taking each of those in turn then, um, the first in relation to an express statutory duty is relatively straightforward. Uh, where statute expressly requires reasons to be given, there is of course a duty on decision makers to do so, in accordance with the express terms uh, of that statute. I've given uh, one particular example uh, in the slide, of course, there's many examples, uh, but Regulation uh, 73B of the Openness uh, of Local Government Regulations 2014 provides a particularly interesting and I think wide-reaching example uh, where there is a duty on public authorities, uh, local government, uh, to provide reasons for certain classes of delegated decisions. So for example, granting of licenses, permissions, or decisions affecting the rights of others. The uh, next uh, and related uh, exist, uh, source of a duty to give reasons then is an implied statutory duty. So if a field is occupied by a statute, but there's no express duty, the next question the court will often ask itself is whether or not there is an implied duty to give reasons contained within the statute. And I think it goes back to uh, Melissa's presentation quite well uh, about an interaction between statute and common law. Uh, the court saying uh, as far back as the duty case in 94, um, that it is indeed beyond question that a duty may in appropriate circumstances be implied into a statute on grounds of fairness. And the Cunningham case provides a good example um, of how the court will undertake that exercise, carefully looking at the terms of the statutory framework against the familiar considerations of fairness under the common law. And I think, again, it's fair to say that where a statute does not um, say that there is an express duty to give reasons, claimants do generally uh, face quite an uphill struggle to convince a court that there nevertheless should be an implied statutory duty um, within the regime. So turning then from the issue of statute uh, over to the common law, uh, the starting point uh, is in fact relatively uh, clear under the common law. Uh, there's no general public law duty to give reasons, uh, but as Lord Cornworth said recently in the Dover case, it is well established that fairness may in some circumstances require it, even in a statutory context where there's no express duty imposed brackets or even if there's no implied um, statutory duty. So if uh, no express duty, no implied duty, you then fall back to the common law. Now I've set out the general position being that there is no general duty under the common law, but I think it's important to recognize the trend of the case law in this area. Uh, in 2008, um, in the Hassan case, the Court of Appeal said 
that there is indeed a trend towards an increased recognition of a duty to give reasons. And this was picked up again by uh, Lord Justice Elias in the uh, Oakley case in the Court of Appeal, his view being that it's actually more accurate to say uh, the common law is moving to a position where reasons are always required unless there is a proper justification for not doing so. Now, whilst that doesn't represent the state of the common law at the moment, I think it's certainly fair to say that if you look at the cases and where the case law has been going on this, it seems to be that the cases where reasons are not required uh, are increasingly becoming the exception. And I think the advice given um, by the authors in De Smith that public authorities would be well advised to consider carefully whether or not reasons need to be given as a result of this trend in the case law is, is very sage uh, advice. Uh, if you are considering that question, then what are the types of factors you need to be thinking about? Well, the question uh, is relatively simple but difficult to answer. Uh, the question is simply whether fairness requires reasons to be given. And if we look at the case law, some uh, factors that can be drawn out. The first, and I think the most significant, is the likely impact and importance of the decision, including whether or not it will have any lasting relevance. So obviously, uh, the greater the impact, um, the more important the decision, um, the more wide reaching its implications, the more likely it is that reasons will need to be given. Uh, secondly, then, uh, is the line of case law that says where a decision is aberrant or otherwise cries out for an explanation, reasons should be given. And really, I think the best way to express that is to take a step back, to look uh, at the decision, and if it raises an eyebrow, it's probably one of those decisions where you should be giving reasons. The third is, again, uh, comes from a line of case law relating to rights of appeal. Uh, where uh, there is a right of appeal contained within statute, then reasons will typically be necessary in order to give practical effect to that right of appeal. So obviously it will be difficult for someone to exercise a right of appeal if they don't have the reasons for the first instance decision. And the courts have typically stepped in in those circumstances to say fairness requires reasons to be given. And uh, finally, uh, is the nature of the decision making process. Uh, whilst the common law has over the past 30 or 40 years moved away from rigid classifications of judicial versus administrative decisions, uh, in this context, uh, the, requ the, the requirements of fairness are particularly high, for example, in a judicial context and perhaps less so in an administrative context, uh, but again, depending on what's being discussed. So if you have a judicial process, you're much more likely to have a duty to give reasons. If you have an administrative uh, context that's dealing with quite a, a weighty issue, for example, human rights, again, uh, it's much more likely that reasons will be required. And uh, taking a step back again, some cases which are of general uh, applicability really right across the board, the courts have said there will be a duty to give reasons when you are departing from policy. Generally speaking, individuals and members of the public have an expectation that policy will be followed. So where a public authority departs from a, a policy, it should give adequate reasons for doing so. Uh, second, then, a duty to explain inconsistent decisions. Uh, Melissa pointed out the uh, underlying common law principle uh, of uh, consistency. Uh, and where a public authority acts inconsistently, uh, the common law will require it to explain its reasons uh, for doing so. Uh, thirdly, then, uh, duty to give reasons for frustrating a legitimate expectation, uh, simply to explain uh, why you have decided uh, it's appropriate in the circumstances of the case not to adhere to that. Uh, and fourthly, a duty to give reasons for rejecting expert evidence. Uh, if all that you have before you uh, is an expert report that goes one way, uh, if you're proposing to go the opposite way, uh, then you should uh, give reasons for doing so. And then finally, the last source of the duty to give reasons, of course, is the legitimate expectation. Uh, individuals may have a legitimate expectation that reasons will be given, arising as a result either of an express promise or through past practice. And I've given the recent example there uh, of the Sea of Britain's Heritage case, where the Court of Appeal held a legitimate expectation uh, arose uh, 
when the Secretary of State was deciding whether or not to call in a planning application. So turning from the uh, first of the questions which I posed uh, to the second, uh, and the second being what uh, is required when you are uh, under a duty to give reasons, I think this uh, quote from uh, Mr Justice Supperstone in Davies' case uh, provides a good overview of what is uh, required. Uh, in, as he says, in short, um, you must have come to grips with the decision, uh, tell the parties in broad terms uh, why you lost or won, the reasons must be adequate and intelligible, uh, and they must relate to the evidence within the case. Of course, those of us uh, who are uh, practicing uh, in particular in the planning field uh, will be aware of the South Bucks formulation uh, of that test. Again, uh, it deals with the uh, same points, uh, broadly speaking, adequate and intelligible reasons, uh, coming to grips with the arguments of both sides, uh, reaching a conclusion on the principal important controversial issues, explaining why uh, the individual won or lost, uh, and not leaving any substantial doubt as to uh, any error of law. Just some other brief observations on that uh, duty to give reasons. Of course, the, the reasons do not need to be lengthy uh, or elaborate. Uh, the length of the reason is not necessarily an indication uh, of their quality, uh, but of course, uh, you must come to grips with the case uh, before you. It's not enough for you simply to uh, state a, a generic conclusion or use generic reasons. The reasons must be tailored to the decision in front of you. Uh, and of course, it's not necessary to give reasons for reasons. What is required is an explanation, an adequate explanation of the final decision, not each and every step within the decision-making process. The courts will adopt a, a relatively sensible and straightforward approach when assessing adequacy. Uh, we're not looking at statutes or interpreting contracts. Uh, and they will be willing to give glaring miscalculations or obvious errors within reasons, provided that they have not misled anyone. And just one final point uh, on the content, I think it's important to recognise that whether or not you give reasons as a result of a duty to do so, uh, or you decide to do so voluntarily, uh, you will be assessed against the same standards that we've just went uh, through. And that leads me then finally on to the, the third and, 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 and final question, really, what are the consequences of a failure uh, to give adequate reasons? And this is often uh, one of the most fertile grounds for arguments about judicial discretion. Of course, in public law, the, the, the remedy uh, is within the discretion of the court. Uh, and the fact that you have made good one of your grounds does not necessarily mean that you'll get a remedy uh, from the court. Arguments in the reasons uh, field uh, are often uh, successful. I've given uh, one example there of the Rogers case where Mrs Justice Lang declined relief uh, based in part upon the fact that there were reasons given in a witness statement that adequately explained the decision. And indeed, most of the cases in which uh, relief has been refused, it's been because reasons were given either in a witness statement uh, in correspondence following uh, the decision uh, or in pre-action correspondence. So if you're defending such a challenge, you might want to think about giving reasons at an early point uh, in order to help you when it gets to discretion arguments. Courts, of course, do have other uh, tools within their uh, arsenal. Uh, for example, some cases they've granted mandatory orders requiring reasons to be given. Uh, and I'm aware of one case as well where a declaration was given to say, you've breached the duty to give reasons, but the ultimate decision was not quashed. But again, a, a word of caution here, generally speaking, the courts uh, are exercising uh, caution and are quite skeptical of ex post facto reasons or ex post facto rationalization of decisions. A, a quashing order is particularly likely to follow where a, a defect in the reasoning goes to the heart of the decision uh, or where there has been a, a breach of a statutory duty to give reasons. And the reason for that is that the uh, statutory duty is often seen as uh, a key aspect of the lawful exercise of the statutory uh, power. Uh, what you are looking at, for example, uh, it, it, the types of factors the court would consider is, um, you know, are the reasons that have been given consistent with the uh, earlier reasons? Is there a particular period of delay between it? Um, etc. Um, so again, the courts, uh, I think, while receptive to arguments about discretion, 
uh, or uh, skeptical um, of them. Um, so I'm going to um, pass back to uh, Richard um, now uh, and stop sharing the slides. Excellent. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Connor. Thank you. So a reminder to everyone, please, if you have questions or comments, please use the Q&A function on the system to ask them. And just a reminder as well that we are recording the webinar. So our final presentation is from James Pereira and Horatio Waller. Now, James will be familiar to many of you. He regularly acts both for and against public authorities in a broad range of public and administrative law areas and has been involved over the years in leading cases such as Balchin, uh, Hoare and the congestion charging judicial review. Horatio's experience covers also a wide range of public law fields including licensing, education, equalities and antisocial behaviour uh, and has been involved already in a number of significant judicial reviews in the planning field. Before coming to the bar, Horatio spent time at the Law Commission working on a project on the law of mental capacity and deprivation of liberty safeguard. So I will hand over now to James first and then Horatio to follow. Thank you, uh, Richard. Morning, everyone. So Horatio and I are working on a few cases together and, and one of the things that's um, come up, one of the interesting things that's come up is this idea of a, of a power to for public authorities to withdraw um, reports or decisions or kind of halt processes that they've started. And it's, it's quite an interesting area because there are lots of statutes where there are express powers to withdraw things. There are plenty of statutes that give express powers, um, but there are some that don't. And of course, there's a general principle of statutory interpretation that where parliament could have created a power to do something, but that power isn't there, often that will weigh against the existence of the power because it will be said, well, if Parliament had wanted this power to exist, it would have put it there. It's done it in other statutes. So therefore, we must assume that it decided not to create a power here. Um, but in the cases we're going to look at, they're all cases where the courts implied a power to withdraw or undo or stop uh, a process or withdraw a decision that's already been taken. Um, why is this helpful to, to know about? Well, it's obviously e easier and more cost effective if you are a public authority rather than having to go to court to undo a decision of your own if you think it's unlawful, if you can simply withdraw it. Similarly, if you're acting for a claimant, easier to persuade a local authority to undo something and, and redetermine its decision than to go to court. More cost effective. Um, often quicker and often there are PR benefits of it because you can control a process that lies within the realm of your decision making in a way that you perhaps can't when it's a matter for the court. So what we're going to do really is through a series of case studies just look at the kinds of circumstances that may enable the court to imply a power to withdraw or undo um, certain things. Now um, we're going to look at uh, examples from these areas, statutory nuisance planning, police powers and language schemes. I'm going to deal with half of it and um, Horatio the other half. Well, there's, a, there's a, a, an interesting point on statutory nuisance. I'm actually going to come back to that and start somewhere else. So I'm going to start with local plans. So local plans in, in the planning context are statutory plans. It's the development plan for the local authorities area that sets out the policies which will be applied um, when planning applications are made. And local plans have to go through a process where they're made in draft by the public authority, they're then published, they're consulted upon, they're then examined by an independent inspector who may or may not recommend changes, and they're then adopted. There is now under the legislation a power to withdraw local plans, but there wasn't um, earlier. And the Persimmon case, which is the first one I'm going to mention, uh, existed, took place under the previous legislation when there wasn't a power. So this was a case where the uh, authority had issued a plan um, and it was going through the statutory processes and then the government changed its national housing policy. And so the question for the authority was, do we carry on with this development plan? or do we um, halt the process and withdraw it? 
And they went to two barristers. One barrister said, it makes no sense for you to carry on with the process because uh, it would be unreasonable for you to adopt the plan. And another barrister told them, actually, all you need to do is just update the plan and you can carry on with the process. So they had advice that the process might still work. They didn't have to withdraw the plan. But nevertheless, they decided to um, withdraw it. And the withdrawal was litigated. It was challenged by housing developers who had an interest in the plan continuing. And the court noted, first of all, that for other kinds of plan, there were express powers to withdraw. So straight away, you would think that that would weigh very strongly against a power to withdraw this kind of plan, because in the legislative scheme, there were express powers to withdraw other plans. Um, but you could see the court wasn't really happy with that um, outcome. So what it then um, searched around for was an ambiguity in the legislation, because it said, look, if we can find an ambiguity, that opens the door to us implying a power. And, and through um, a rather tortuous process of interpretation, it decided that there was an ambiguity in the legislation and that enabled it to imply a power to um, withdraw. And it, and it did so for, or it justified its decision for a number of reasons. But the key point which we've put on the slide here is that the existence of a power in the uh, eyes of the court was necessary to prevent the authority from having to carry out, follow through this expensive procedure when it knew that the outcome uh, was going to be that it was not going to adopt the plan in the first place. The court did comment that it would rarely be the case that the court would ex that the authority would be justified in exercising um, its power to withdraw the plan, but nevertheless the power existed. So for me, I think there are kind of three points that come out of this. One is that the court will always want some formal um, statutory in uh, interpretation approach to base its decision on. So in this case, it was the need for an ambiguity in the legislation, which gave it the court space to imply a power. And then secondly, and thirdly, of course, there has to be some kind of reason for implying it. So here, the court suggested it would be necessary. And the court also said it was part of the reason it was necessary is to avoid absurd consequences. So there's some question about um, absurdity there without the existence of the power. It would be absurd if the power didn't exist. So there's one example. Second example, and I'm going to deal with this very briefly because I want to go back to the statutory nuisance um, case because it's, that's a slightly different um, approach that was taken there. Another example, again, planning concerns call-in decisions. So normally it's the planning authority that makes a decision whether to grant planning permission or not. And if that decision is appealed, it's the planning inspector who takes that um, decision, nominally on behalf of the Secretary of State, but, but the planning inspector takes the decision. But under the planning um, regime, the Secretary of State has the power to what's called call in a decision for his own determination. And so um, when he does that, he effectively or she makes the decision, not the planning authority and not directly the inspector. It's a very wide discretionary power. There's some policy that accompanies it um, concerning the uh, national interest and the importance that the project will normally have to have, but it's a very wide power. And so in this case, the um, trustees of the Friends of the Lake District case, the Secretary of State had called in a decision. The question was, could he, as it were, reverse his decision to call in? Was there a power to withdraw the call in direction? And uh, again, the court said, yes, there was. And really for two um, main reasons. One is it made practical sense. So that goes to the kind of motive um, for it. it. It made practical sense. And the second was the court was very um, swayed by the fact that this was really just a procedural power. The, the calling power was concerned with not how the decision was going to be taken in the sense of what policies would be applied and, and so on, whether it was a good decision or a bad decision, it was concerned with who was going to take the decision. So it changed the nature of the procedure. And one of the themes that arises in this case and in other cases is that where the power and the context that you're, we're concerned with is simply procedural, I say simply not to diminish 
procedure, but it's procedural rather than substantive, rather than giving rights to a particular outcome. Where it's procedural, the court will be more willing to imply a power to undo um, something that's been done earlier. So now I want to go back to the statutory nuisance uh, case because um, it's, it's in, in this one, the, in this case, the court took a rather different approach. So this was about a, whether there was a, an implied power to withdraw a statutory nuisance abatement notice. And just to give a little sketch of the statutory regime, um, where the local authority um, consider that there's a statutory nuisance, then subject to a little bit of qualification, but for, for present purposes, they're under a duty to serve an abatement notice. And so, for example, if there's noise coming from a factory, they'd be under a duty to, that's causing a nuisance, they'd be under a duty to serve an abatement notice. The abatement notice will require certain things to be done. The recipient of the notice can appeal it to the magistrate's court. The magistrate can set the notice aside, uphold the notice or bury it. Um, the notice, if it's breached, can lead to a prosecution. So the local authority can breach the, uh, can prosecute the person upon whom the notice was served if they don't comply with the notice. So there are um, express powers and indeed a duty to serve a notice, but there's no express power to withdraw a notice. So one of the issues that arose in this case was whether such a power could be implied. Now, the interesting thing here is that there are a number of layers to the um, statutory regime. So it's not simply a question of the local authority being able to serve a notice. That notice can then be the subject in, of an appeal where, that, where there'll be uh, another party, the um, person who has served with the notice. The public may also have an interest in the notice, obviously, because often it's been, it's been served in order to protect them from a nuisance. So, it's not quite as straightforward as um, other cases where there's a kind of bipartite situation or where there's simply a procedure that's been entered into. There are wider considerations here. But nevertheless, the court said there was an implied power to withdraw uh, an abatement notice um, where the authority decides um, that it it's no longer serves any purpose. And it could do this even if the, um, even if the notice was lawful. Um, and the interesting thing about this case, from my um, perspective, is that the court didn't really concern itself with questions of whether the legislation was ambiguous, or even really whether it was necessary to imply a, a power. Um, instead, what the judge said was that uh, it was sensible to imply a power because the legislative regime would be unduly rigid um, without it. And the judge decides, thought that it would be senseless for there not to be um, a power to withdraw. And, and the um, power was described in very broad terms. So the judge said that the power exists to withdraw if for whatever reason it, it being the local authority, no longer considers it to be appropriate, no longer considers the notice to be appropriate. So um, that was a, an example of a very, um, broad power being implied, really without the same kind of um, rigor for there being necessity or ambiguity, but very much the judge considering that it would be a good thing for the power to be there uh, and that the power was consistent with the legislative regime. Um, so it really represents a more kind of liberal or one might say looser approach. Um, it was upheld on appeal when this point was, uh, was considered. So it's quite a nice case in the sense that it does give a more, uh, a greater scope for um, justifying an implied power than some of the other cases might, might suggest. So with that, I'm going to um, move the slides on to the first slide that Horatio will be taking over. And I'm going to mute my microphone and um, hand over to Horatio. Thank you. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. You'll see that I have not sought to meet Melissa's challenge of showing off how uh, learned my bookcase um, looks. Uh, and in fact, I've got my virtual background on mostly because I was concerned that my cat will come into the picture and steal my thunder. So I'm sorry about that. And uh, you'll see that uh, You'll see if we just sort out the, out the slides. I think we need to go to the slide that starts with that one there. Yes, thank you, James. 
So we're moving from the world of strategy nuisance and planning to antisocial behaviour as a context in which implied powers to withdraw have been considered. And a case, Stannard, I'll mention in a moment, concerned the issuing of community protection notices under the 2014 Act. And these are notices issued on someone who's perceived to be committing ASB and the notice will place restrictions on them uh, in an attempt to try and uh, regulate their ASB. Now what happened in the Stannard case was that someone who was served with a notice and who was prosecuted for breaching that notice sought to argue in court that they had a defence, that they must have a defence of being able to argue that the notice was no longer reasonable. And the reason why they said that that defence must exist is because under the 2014 regime, there was no process in which a notice issued can be withdrawn after it's come into effect. And that, uh, that must mean the defendant argued that there was uh, some sort of defence open to them to argue that, that the notice was no longer reasonable. The divisional court said that there was no such defence. It rejected that argument, but that was in part because the divisional court found that an implied power to withdraw or vary a notice can be found within the 2014 regime. So this uh, case is, a, is an illustration then of, uh, again, of a finding of an implied power uh, within a regime in order to fix what was perceived to be a problem that Parliament uh, had not expressly dealt with. So we move on to the next slide and if we move on to the next slide, then we'll deal with uh, Welsh language schemes. Thank you. And uh, we're moving on to Wales then. So the Welsh Language Act 1993, this is very much Annabelle's territory. This uh, was an act designed to promote and facilitate the use of the Welsh language. And one of the aspects of this act was a duty on public bodies providing services in Wales to prepare language schemes which essentially are schemes that will detail how that public body will uh, attempt to facilitate the Welsh language within their organisation. The case I'll discuss in a moment uh, arose uh, uh, in the context of a Crown body attempting several years after publishing a language scheme to withdraw it because it had decided that the scheme was costing too much money and uh, there was no express power to withdraw. So if we move on to the next slide. Uh, we see there the case Welsh Language Commission of the National Saving and Investment. So NSNI was the crown body and they sought to uh, withdraw a scheme uh, originally created in 1988 because they found it cost too much money. The, uh, this was challenged by the Welsh Language Commissioner who was responsible for administering the regime and the, uh, the court, the High Court, decided firstly that the Crown, uh, a Crown body must have an implied power to withdraw a language scheme and uh, that should exist within the regime in order to, uh, in order to essentially fill a gap. However, in the circumstances of this case, the purported withdrawal uh, was considered to be unlawful. And that was because the uh, court accepted the argument that NSNI had, uh, was subject to a legitimate expectation that they would, before withdrawing a scheme, first consult the Welsh language commissioner. And that legitimate expectation had been breached and therefore the withdrawal was unlawful. And so, so here we see a case illustrating the uh, sorts of public law challenges that can follow where a withdrawal under implied powers is conducted. So we move on to the next slide. And uh, here we've tried to tease out cases where implied powers were not uh, found to exist. And what these cases suggest, uh, James and I say, is that where a decision or document creates substantive rights as opposed to procedural rights, uh, it's more likely that, uh, that the court will refuse to imply power, or 
where the legislation already provides a mechanism of withdrawal. And the, uh, the argument is that withdrawal should be uh, implied in, in wider circumstances, not provided for. And, and again, that's a situation where the court will be cautious about implying a power. So if we look at the cases, the first is the case of Gleason developments. And what happened here was that in the planning context, following a public inquiry, an inspector a, uh, purported to grant planning permission for a residential housing scheme, only for a couple of hours later, for the Secretary of State to uh, send a letter saying that I would like to call this application in for my own determination. And what the Secretary of State's uh, position was, was that the uh, permission that the inspector had issued could be withdrawn by, uh, by the Secretary of State. And that was an argument that failed in, uh, in court. And uh, the court uh, was, was of the view that there could not be a power to withdraw a planning permission implied within the Act, essentially for two reasons. The first is that a planning permission creates substantive rights, uh, especially from the perspective of a landowner or developer in order to develop land. And that it weighs against there being a power to withdraw implied within uh, the statute. The second thing is that there is already under the Act a formal mechanism for withdrawing planning permission and that uh, is subject to a uh, compensation for anyone who's adversely affected by the withdrawal of the permission. And the fact that there was this express regime created by Parliament, the court found suggested that Parliament could not have intended for a wider power of withdrawal to exist. Then moving on to the Hillingdon London regional transport case, this is a bit of an anomalous case concerning uh, powers to uh, install bus shelters. And what happened here was that the, uh, the um, borough of Hillingdon sought to withdraw a agreement it had with London Regional Transport for bus shelters in order to reach a new deal with, uh, with the advertiser uh, JCP um, for it to install a different type of arrangement. But the court uh, found after a lengthy debate that within the London Passenger Transport Act 1935 that created the system for, uh, for bus shelters, uh, that uh, consent granted under that regime could not be withdrawn. So if we move from uh, that slide to the next slide and draw some of the threads together, these are the important questions to ask when trying to identify whether an implied power might exist. So does this decision create substantive or merely uh, procedural rights? If it's substantive, it seems it's less likely that a power can be implied. How widely is the administrative body's discretion drawn? The more widely it is drawn, the more likely that it might have a power to withdraw decisions that it has made. Is there already a process for withdrawal provided under the regime? If so, the argument could be made that this suggests there is no wider power that can be implied in the regime. And lastly, would refusing to recognise the power lead to absurd results? So for example, in relation to the persimmon local plans case that James mentioned, uh, that was a factor that weighed with the court that the authority, if it can't withdraw a plan, might need to undertake an expensive process for no sensible result. We move to the next slide. Uh, we have here some questions that are worth asking if an implied power does exist or it might exist. So this might create an opportunity for a disgruntled interested party to request a decision is reconsidered. It may also allow a public authority to reverse decisions if new facts or policy come to light or because they consider that a decision in hindsight was unlawful and they wish to avoid uh, litigation as a way of resolving that matter. But also it's important uh, to recognise as the Welsh language case demonstrates that a withdrawal under implied powers like any public power is subject to judicial review and so any public authority doing this uh, 
uh, must um, and consider exercising uh, that power lawfully. We move to the next slide. And uh, in that regard, when it comes to potential judicial reviews of withdrawals, the Welsh language case uh, gives us an example of legitimate expectation being used as, uh, as an argument. But also it seems uh, to us that in general, there could be arguments made with respect to the taking into account of relevant considerations. And uh, it seems uh, to us again that the length of time that has elapsed between the date a decision was made and the date uh, it um, is uh, considered for revocation or withdrawal, that that might be a relevant consideration. And also whether there has been any prejudice to interested parties, whether there would be any prejudice resulting from withdrawal that can't be addressed, for example, by reconsulting. Now, just finally, before I hand back to Richard, uh, we have given a little thought as to areas to look out for, for where um, implied powers to uh, withdraw might exist. And just to briefly mention a few, uh, the Ombudsman regime, whereby uh, Ombudsman look into complaints of maladministration and issue reports following their investigations, that there is a regime where possibly there could be an argument about the powers to withdraw, under the planning regime, uh, possibly of Section 102 orders, uh, whereby there are orders um, requiring the discontinuous of, of uses of land, uh, there might be room for it there. Uh, and uh, looking also in the highways context at making um, modifications to the definitive map, uh, whereby a, a, an order is made and um, that needs to be confirmed. Possibly there's room there to find a power to withdraw uh, an order before it is uh, confirmed. So that those are the sorts of uh, areas that, uh, that James and I, after um, some sort of brief thought, uh, consider that, um, that there might be room for this debate to take place in future. And uh, with that, we'll hand back to Richard. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, James and Horatio. We've got just under 10 minutes left now for questions. So before we move to that, I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, following on from Annabelle's presentation, there's an environmental law webinar this afternoon at three o'clock, which will cover air quality issues in light of the COVID-19 emergency. And secondly, our next public law webinar is going to be on the 22nd of May. That's going to be chaired by Sarah Sackman and will cover procedural issues in judicial review. So um, I'll move now to questions. Um, and the first one that's come up is uh, one which relates to Melissa's presentation, which is what effect will leaving the EU have on the balance between judge applied common law principles and the primacy of statute law? And then also will the loss of high level principles of interpretation, such as the precautionary principle in environmental law, mean a diminished role for the court to give their own interpretation to domestic legislation and decisions? So, Melissa. Thank you. Um, can you hear me there, Richard? Yeah. Perfect. Um, I I am going to take these two questions together and actually I think they are they're, uh, great questions and a to give a direct answer to start with, well my bet would be that the, the situation will call for a renewed muscularity in environmental decision making um, and that will include at a judicial level. Um, I don't see any real likelihood of diminished role for the, judici for the ju judiciary arising from any of that. And just then winding back to understand the reasons for that. Um, the precautionary approach, uh, well, I, I know that we've got um, James Pereira also on the panel here. James, I think you're in the um, seminal, one of the seminal cases on the subject of the precautionary uh, principle loader. So it may be that you want to add to this or indeed correct any of it. Um, but my uh, best recollection is that the precautionary approach uh, derives from the treaty of the functioning of the European Union and that that treaty sought protection, high level protection of the 
a high level of protection of the environment um, and that that be based upon the precautionary principle. Well, post-Brexit, what then? Um, regular attendees of FTB seminars and webinars may um, have an inkling as to what happens next. The Environment um, Bill promise, promised, promises um, an environmental principles policy statement and that policy statement to include five principles among them the precautionary principle. Well so what is the effect of that? You'll have heard during my presentation that I have been argued in favour of a dynamic purposive approach to statutory construction. I see scope following Tesco and Dundee and the plethora of cases on the national planning policy framework, for example, to deploy such a national policy statement in a not dissimilar way. But it remains to be seen, I would acknowledge, that that fundamental difference in status between a treaty and a national policy statement, it remains to be seen what effect that has in practical terms, whether that has the effect of weakening environmental protection or not. And that, of course, all of that is quite apart from the economic reality that we um, may be facing, which will increase, I think we would suspect, the threats to the protection of the environment. And so perhaps a new tension between objectives. So that would be my answer to those questions. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to save James for another question in a moment, but turn now um, to Connor. And there's a question, Connor, in relation to the duty to give reasons where the trend is moving towards mm. the duty to give reasons. And the question is really, how rare is it now um, to be able not to give reasons? And what type of decisions don't now need reasons? Uh, so a, a very good question and I think um, it, I think the straight answer is it is increasingly rare for decisions to come before the courts where public authorities do not need to give decisions uh, and in one of the cases on the slides I think it was described as um, it's almost becoming the case where uh, those instances where reasons are not required are becoming the exception uh, and the general position is give reasons um, in all cases. Um, the types of cases that typically arise um, in the planning context, for example, um, are instances where a, an officer has uh, recommended refusal, uh, but the uh, committee disagrees and grants permission. Uh, there then is a question about whether or not there's a duty to give reasons um, in those circumstances. Um, it doesn't arise in statute, uh, but there's a, a question about the common law and duty, and that's been quite a fertile ground for litigation uh, in recent uh, years. In respect of the uh, particular provision that was mentioned, the, the withdrawal of, of Planning Commission, etc., certainly strikes me that if there was an instance where Planning Commission was withdrawn, um, then that would be uh, certainly, in, in my view, an instance where reasons should be given. Uh, if a local planning authority declines after a request to uh, w withdraw Planning Commission, I think that's arguable. I think that would be an instance where you would have to look at those common law factors um, and for example if there was significant environmental harm or personal circumstances that were driving forward the request um, or it was particularly important development or something like that that's more likely to lead to a situation where reasons would be given but I don't think it would be the case where in every circumstance there's been a refusal to withdraw planning permission that would that would trigger a duty to give reasons but as I said the general trend I think is give reasons um, and, and the cases where that's not um, been found are increasingly rare. Thank you. Um, now we've got two questions which are fairly similar so I'm going to take them together and it concerns circumstances in which when there's a challenge to a decision reasons are given for example in a pre-action protocol letter of response uh, and how persuasive a court is likely to view such reasons and indeed whether it would ever be enough to get you home. So Annabelle, would you like to take this question, please? Yes, thank you, Richard. And I, I, I saw this uh, question and I, uh, it brought back uh, many 
happy and not so happy memories for me of acting uh, in the case of Jedwell and Denbyshire some years ago because this is sort of exactly what what happened. Uh, it was to do with an EIA screening opinion where no reasons had been given uh, and so we as a claimant challenging that didn't know if cumulative effects had been taken into account so we issue judicial review proceedings and then the planning officer comes back with a witness statement saying actually I did take into account all the cumulative effects and here are all my reasons why EIA was not required. Um, and so in the High Court, the High Court said that yes, uh, the original screening opinion was flawed, there was a breach of the duty to give reasons, but that had been rescued, was the judge's words, by the uh, planning officer's witness statement. So we said, well, that's all terribly unfair. You know, you can't just come along with a witness statement and say all these things after the event and went off to the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal agreed with us and said, you can't just put in a witness statement with no testing. But what they said was that we should be entitled to cross-examine the planning officer in order to establish whether these really were her reasons for finding that EIA was not required or if she had simply made it up in the course of the litigation. So that's quite a, an, an uphill struggle when you're seeking to cross-examine someone and say no 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 you definitely made it up haven't you and she says no 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 I really thought that at the time and you know so I sat there in the high court cross-examining this uh, very nice planning officer um, and um, the judge said yeah she was very credible and um, obviously telling the truth and she obviously did think about cumulative effects and she obviously thought about all of these things at the time she just didn't record it. Um, so when we went back to the High Court, the, the, the court found that yes, there, there had been a breach of the duty to give reasons, but he refused to quash the planning permission because he was satisfied on the basis of the planning officer's testimony, which had been subject to um, strenuous cross-examination by me, that, um, that there was no actual flaw and she had taken into account what she needed to. So um, I think the lesson to be learned from that is um, you can rely on, on reasons given after the event, but the court will need to be satisfied that they're not simply ex post facto justification and the court will pay particular scrutiny to whether they are representative of the contemporaneous reasons or have been simply cobbled together to try and rescue uh, a legal error. Um, and you may end up in a situation where you um, have cross-examination in judicial review, which is quite unusual. Um, well, hopefully the threat of um, cross-examination in the High Court will be enough to ensure that civil servants and local authority officers do properly record decisions at uh, the add? time. So we've no. got now just a minute for one final question, and this is directed towards James and Horatio, and it's how the power to withdraw decisions uh, relates to where decision makers would be functus officio. James. Yeah, so very briefly, I guess, um, I'm not entirely sure what the strict translation of functus officio is, but basically it means that the, the um, public authority or the public officer's powers are spent, they're done, there's nothing more that they can do. So um, that's kind of the polar opposite of there being a, a subsisting power to undo or to withdraw what's already being done. So I suppose the way to look at it is if you're in a debate about is there an implied power to withdraw or to undo, um, one side's arguing that there is, the other side is effectively saying, no, um, the powers are functus officio, they're, they're, they're done. If that's the case, then the only way that you can undo or withdraw or reverse the decision is to go to court and get it quashed. Um, because if you don't do that, then the presumption of legality and regularity will apply, which is to say, even if the decision was taken unlawfully, if it's not overturned in the court, it will stand as a, as a lawful decision. So they're kind of two, um, polar ends of, of, of the same debate. Excellent. Thank you. Anything, Horatio, that you wanted to add? No, nothing to add from me. Okay. I think James summed it up perfectly. Thank you, Richard. Well, I'll draw things to a close then because we're right on the deadline. Thank you very much indeed um, for all of you uh, watching uh, the webinar. Hopefully it's been useful and hopefully we'll see you again on another one of these, including that relating to judicial review procedure on the 22nd of May to be chaired by Sarah Sackman. Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone.